Thank you again so much for joining us for the Great Lakes Regional Town Hall. The Great Lakes region is super special because we recently started this initiative for the Regional Town Hall. So kind of get into the nitty gritty of the region, make sure we're capturing what our members need, what they need from us, what they would like to hear from us. And Great Lakes just happened to be the first group to go. So we're hoping that we can make this a very engaging session. You hear from myself, I'm L'Oreal Lance, your membership and business development director. You'll hear from my colleague Taylor, who will be chatting about some legislative issues, as well as our regional director in your region, Dan Wedge. So let's get to some Zoom etiquette, if you will. I already love hearing that people are connecting. That's exactly what we wanted to happen. This session is being held in meeting format. And so you'll be able to connect and engage and please use the chat button or say whatever you need to say verbally, whatever is most comfortable for you. And if you have a question, again, if the moment strikes you, please let us know what your question or comment is. So let's keep moving. Again, I'm Laurie Lance, your membership director. I joined CTAA in November 2019. So fairly new to the transit space, but eager to hear what everyone has to say and how I can be of most use to you. I want to just briefly go through some of your member benefits, maybe some things that you're aware of and maybe some that you weren't. So of course we have our bi-weekly fast mail and that's where a lot of advocacy and policy efforts are listed. You can also look there to hear information about your colleagues in different states and regions around the country. We also have a relatively new monthly member newsletter that comes out typically the first week of the month and it's a great place to find out what's going on at CTAA with our board, with our staff who work on various grant projects. It's also a great place to find out what the question of the month is. And the question of the month is submitted by your peers. So I welcome you if you have any kind of broad questions that you would like answered and you would like to see how your peers are tackling certain issues, please do email those questions to events at ctaa.org. And we will happily add your question into the newsletter. You would be surprised by how many responses we get and we get all of those answers back to the original question seeker. And so it's been a, a great peer-to-peer -peer exchange that we've initiated. And we also have monthly industry webinars. Over the course of the summer, we've had a few events that Dan will get into. So things have kind of slowed down a bit, but as we go into the fall, we have a jam-packed um, fall webinar schedule. So that way you can learn a little bit about various industry needs. We have a variety of events. Dan will touch on that a little bit too, but we have a lot of things percolating in the virtual space. Um, we also have background checks. I believe that's something that a lot of people don't know that we offer at a highly discounted rate through IntelliCorp. If you go on our website and go under the membership tab, you can find out some more information about how to utilize those resources. And speaking of resources, we also have a COVID-19 resources page. It's at the very front of our website where you can click into that page. Um, one of the highlights there, in addition to all of the support and resources that CTAA has provided since the crisis started, is a relatively new buyer's guide that myself and my colleague Taylor, who's on the call with us today, put forth along with in partnership with the FTA and AFTA. And so it's a great place to figure out if you need to buy something, any sort of PPE, anything really that could be COVID related, a great place to spend your CARES Act funding. That's exactly where you should go. In addition to that page, you'll find a variety of other resources, roundtables that we've held with different member demographics. So if you're looking to see how small urban systems in, in the country have handled things or how small NEMT systems have handled things, you'll find that there too. And so that is what I have as far as membership updates. Let's keep moving on to our training courses. Very, very recently, we opened a new online training center. So you will find that on our training page and you'll be able to see there that we have a number of items that were in classroom that have been brought online, starting with recruiting, building and retraining a sustainable driver workforce we sense that this would certainly be a need as we move through the coronavirus crisis. 
as drivers retire or just decide that they're no longer comfortable and you bring in new drivers. And so that's a great place to start. Frontline supervisor training. Train the trainer, which is definitely something that people have been asking us to bring online and we were finally able to do that in a new and free course that's in this online training center is understanding passengers who may have experienced trauma. And finally, also within that grouping, you will find our very frequented PASS course. Passenger Assistance Safety and Sensitivity is also grouped in there. And so it's a quick place where you can find everything that you need to um, be a successful system. And next I'll pass it over to Taylor. Thank you so much. So I'm Taylor. I do CTAs, communications, marketing, and I help L'Oreal with membership stuff. So I'm really excited to be with you guys today. I wanted to just do a really quick update on the 5339 uh, grants that were released last week from the FTA. You can see here that there was a total amount awarded of $464 million. In a second, I'll touch on um, how awesome that is because it's the highest it's ever been. There were 96 projects awarded in total. And what makes us really excited is that 61% of these projects were awarded to rural, tribal, and small urban. So basically our membership base, and this was a really, really strong year for this program. This graph is super important because it shows the total funding growth of the program over the past four years. So you can see in 2016, we've essentially doubled what the program used to be. Um, we have worked really, really closely with the bus coalition to kind of make this happen. We have been on the Hill constantly talking to members of Congress, encouraging them to support this program. And thanks to the bus coalition, you know, we've been really successful with this. I think what this graph shows is that Congress is really receptive to the needs of our members and they view this as a really important issue. So this was really great news to see this next week. And as I'm sure you can imagine, we're already working on FY21 and we're starting all that good work again to make sure the FY21 numbers are the same, if not higher. And this graph just shows the average grant amount growth over the years. Um, the average for this year was 4.8 million for a project. And that's obviously increased over the years. So as we look to increase the total amount of funding for this program, we are definitely looking to see more projects being awarded, more buses and bus facility grants being awarded, and overall um, more money to each of those programs. So that's kind of the update on that. We have a full analysis that we just released this morning that kind of breaks down each year, so 2016 through 2019, what grants were awarded and how many and the funding for each one. So I definitely encourage you to check out our blog where that was posted this morning. So with that, I will turn it over to Dan. Well, thank you, both Taylor and L'Oreal. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Dan Wedge. I'm the Executive Director for Allegan County Transportation in Southwest Michigan. I've been a CTA member for, well, since 2000 and I joined the board back in May of 2017, representing all of you in the Great Lakes region. To cover some of the things we've been up to on August 11th, I hope some of you were able to attend, we had a great opportunity to meet one-on-one -on -one with Jane Williams, the FTA Acting Director. Uh, it began with a short tape session by U.S. Secretary of Transportation, Elaine Chow, uh, followed immediately by a live presentation from the Acting Director. This was a webinar that was for CTA members only. Jane shared uh, you know, the commitment for funding increases, also how FTA has been able to provide support such as you know, vendor lists for COVID-19 supplies and also touched on the, um, the distribution of masks among many other uh, activities that FTA is working on. On June 9th and 10th, CTAA hosted the first ever Transit Industry Virtual Expo. This was in place of our uh, normal spring expo. This is a two-day mini conference, included a virtual session on operations, safety, communications, HR with uh, breakout sessions. Participants discussed how agencies, agencies have overcome challenges related to the pandemic and look forward uh, you know, to the to the future and what might lay ahead. Uh, the recorded sessions are available on the CTA website under the Virtual Expo Transit Restart. I encourage you to go to the website and check that out if you uh, happen to miss that. 
with reauthorization coming up, I encourage all of you to continue to monitor the CTA website for the most up-to-date information. Chris Zunger uh, prepared a brief summary of the House panel proposal that um, uh, highlights the increase in transit funding for 2021. Uh, that too can be found on the website. Not sure exactly what reauthorization will look like during an election year um, or what the potential passage for legislation for transportation will be, but stay tuned and, and again, monitor our website because you can get the up-to-date information there. I would encourage all of you, if you haven't signed up for the members only portion of it, if you scroll to the bottom of our CTAA website, you'll see a section that says members only and you can uh, sign up there if you're not already um, having access to that and you'll be able to access um, even more current information as well as a lot of past information that is uh, you know, saved and made available for, for members only. Uh, so I encourage you to check that out. So thinking about COVID, 19. I'd like to hear from you and your agency as to, you know, what, what you're battling uh, in regards to COVID uh, and what transit might look like post-COVID-19. The uh, next three questions are to help us at CTAA support you and your organization and the message that you want us as an organization to, you know, to be saying both at the federal level, the state level, and to, you know, your, our, our counterparts, the other members within CTAA. So with that, we'll move into the questions. I will encourage you all to you know, take turns, un unmute your mic, introduce yourself, and ask your questions. I would encourage feedback from you know, other uh, members as well that are on the webinar here. And if you're more comfortable and you'd rather just put your question into the chat, um, Taylor uh, will be monitoring that and we'll, we'll be glad to um, read your question out that way. So with that, anybody like to, to go first as to... Um, what this first question. Hey Dan, this is Tom Crimstall, Clark County Transit. Uh, number one, thank you for continuing to represent Michigan and the CTAA. I appreciate that very much. Uh, I think everybody probably has the same uh, feeling, uh, the awareness of what transportation is doing for everybody while we're going through this process. And I think one of my biggest concerns is how do we tell the country that buses are okay to ride without necessarily drawing attention uh, that all the money that we've gotten from FTA uh, with low ridership and less expenses, I don't want to tout that we got all this money because we haven't spent it. And uh, I don't know how to balance those, those two things. So I guess I'd ask uh, CTAA uh, what you might have plans for. I know MDOT is looking at uh, hiring, a, I believe, a, a consultant to put something together that has a unified message from all the transits uh, that says what we're doing. So uh, I guess I'd ask you if you guys are working on something like that. Thank you. Thanks. I can't speak to specifically what um, you know what CTA is working on in regards to that specific messaging, but I know that's a that's a question that I've been asked: is how can we you know kind of reassure our passengers that riding public transit is safe? And I know from you know my own um, situation, you know, I've tried to put the message out there on the number of safety protocols that we've put in place, and that how hard transit has been working in you know the information that has been given to us at both the federal and state level on you know ensuring that uh, first of all that our our employees are safe and that they have the protective uh, you know gear in place that they need to provide safe transportation and then that we're taking efforts to to make sure that the passengers that ride our buses you know have a, a safe um, environment to to you know utilize public transit and to the best of my ability, I've not heard of any, um, you know, major outbreaks or stories that have focused on, you know, a bad experience with public transit. And I think that's the message that, you know, we really uh, want to get out there. I don't know if uh, Taylor or L'Oreal, if you want to. I know. Um, so we haven't put anything kind of concrete together yet on this specific issue. I know, though, we are going to be working with other associations to develop a toolkit that would help um, providers message 
their cleanliness, what they're doing about PPE um, to their writers. So that is coming um, in the fall. And yeah, it's just, we haven't really had good examples because everyone just kind of hit the ground running. And so we really started getting really strong examples of what providers were doing over the summer. So we're looking forward to sharing that with you guys in a couple months. Tom, to your point, Taylor and Scott, our executive director and I were having a conversation yesterday about all the money that, that's been given and how to kind of best manage that situ situation. And the honest answer is we're, we're still navigating that ourselves. Um, we definitely want to ensure that the transit community isn't put in a bad situation by having money still on the books and people looking and getting curious and, and wondering how come the money's not being spent when well, we all know that, that we have to protect those assets um, as we move forward through this crisis because obviously it, it is around for a little bit longer than I think most of us anticipated. And so with that, it's something we're certainly looking at. I will have a conversation with Scott to see if he can probably put some, some thoughts around that and likely put that out in our next member newsletter where he often puts kind of like a state of the union address. Thank Good, you. thank you. Thinking about stakeholder engagement, um, you know, thinking about the agencies that you uh, have provided service with either, you know, prior to COVID or even during COVID, what kind of questions are they asking and, and what um, needs have they, uh, you know, exhibited or how has that changed? I think the two biggest contracts that we have, one is with after school transportation, uh, Sparks program. And of course, they don't have any answers because they're waiting for the schools. And uh, even when they get that answer, I'm not so sure how that equates to the service that we can provide for them. If we're going to have to keep the safe distancing, we'll go from transporting, you know, 24 people on a bus down to six which means you have to have extra buses, extra drivers. That's yet to be unfolded here. Uh, so they're not asking us questions. I guess I'm asking them questions <laughs> of when do they think they're gonna get back into some sort of, of order. Uh, with ridership being so low, uh, those two make up uh, a big percentage of our ridership. So, uh, it's kind of hard to go out and tell the world we're the greatest thing in the world and you don't have ridership to pr prove it. And again, I get back to all the money that's coming down the line. Uh, it's a hard story to sell to legislative people. Uh, so I don't know. It's, it's a strange time. We all know that. I know that our community mental health has, uh, has not reopened for on-site um, you know, appointments, they're still doing everything remotely. And so that's definitely had a, a large impact on our service delivery because uh, they're just not going in and out of the, you know, the agency offices like they, they have in the past. But I understand that that's set to change sometime here soon. Others? This is Becky Allen with Access Johnson County in Indiana. How you doing, Dan? Good. Welcome, nice Becky. Nice beard. Nice beard. <laughs> Something different. Yes. You better save it for Christmas because you can have a second job being a Santa. Of course, you'll need some padding. Okay. So one of the things that surprised me is we have a local manufacturer that contacted me and wanted to know what our protocols were with transporting people to their facility because they were very concerned about that. So I just sent them what I had and they were very happy with it. Um, and they have continued to encourage people to ride the bus. Um, school kids, one of our school, last school corporate, I have six corporations here in Johnson County, and the last one went to school starting yesterday. Um, I do not have as many children as we have had in the past, but I think it's because everybody's doing it just slightly different than the other. They're still doing some online. Um, but I thought that was interesting. And then the other stakeholders I have that came up during COVID is food delivery. We have a lot of food pantries in Johnson County. And so 
we got ourselves into helping them to deliver food boxes every week. So we're still continuing to do that and we think that it might increase again, but that's just some of the stuff that we've done with our stakeholders and trying to be community oriented. You bring up a good point with the food delivery. We, we have been doing that as well. There's been a, um, it's been for seniors and there's been a weekly food distribution and we've participated in that. And as we see that coming to the end in the next couple of weeks here, what we're looking to do is transition that into a, a senior food shopping route. And so that we're going to engage with those individuals early and develop, um, you know, a regular route that would get them, you know, the same needs that they have met by them, you know, being able to go to the store, uh, looking at the early shopping hours so that they can get in early and, and with less traffic. And so that's one idea that we're looking to implement um, with that, you know, as that food uh, delivery service is, is changing. Well, with that, um, I know Katie uh, had just messaged me that she's willing to share what, uh, uh, what they're doing in Minnesota. So Katie, if you want to jump in. Hi, so um, I'm not with a transit organization. I'm with um, the Minnesota Public Transit Association. So we have a bunch of members from people all over the state of Minnesota, a bunch of transit agencies. And at the beginning of all this, we reached out and we're like, hey, what's happening with you guys? And so far what we've seen is across the board, ridership is down. The good news is um, with some universities, opting to hold classes in person that is doing amazing things for those college towns and their transit. And then Chester, Minnesota has the Mayo Clinic. So the Mayo Clinic has stayed open this entire time, obviously. They're a big hospital, really big part of Minnesota. And that has done wonders for Rochester. So we're seeing some transit systems, some of the bigger ones more or less, they are going back to normal hours. They're starting to charge fares again. It's the rural areas that are really struggling because although there is a mask mandate in Minnesota, my sister lives in Blue Earth. It's the middle of nowhere, three hours away from the Twin Cities where I live. And people just don't always follow the mask mandate, making it harder to say, yup, this is safe. We've got this. So what we've been doing here at MIPTA is we're holding a conference this um, October to kind of get some vendors in there who are selling PPE and hand sanitizer and all that and really just trying to push that in the transit community because the more we have those things on hand at transit systems, that seems to help. But with so many contracts being canceled what with universities, some not holding classes, with school not holding classes, that has been a big challenge. And I know in the Twin Cities, my work used to be like 30 minutes all the time. <laughs> and now it's like 10. <laughs> it's crazy. Like nobody's driving anymore. And also you look at the transit systems, nobody's on the light rail. The light rail used to be packed right by my work with tons of people getting on and off. So another thing that's kind of hurting us is, although it's great that a lot of people get to work from home, it's really hurting our transit system. So not only are we battling proving to people that this is safe, but we're battling people not going out as much. And it seems the more we push this message of it's safe, look at all these studies that are saying that like transit is not a hot spot and not to worry about it. That tends to scare people a bit more. So that's just kind of what I've been hearing from the Maj Paj of people who are members of ours, if that helps at all. Well, thank you. Yes, I think that's good information. I also have, um, see the text from uh, Beverly, if you'd like to share what uh, what you're doing? Uh, yeah, um, I'm also in Minnesota. I coordinate in my chat here, the Regional Transportation Coordinating Councils. And on our council, we see um, beyond just transit, we have volunteer driver programs, veteran service programs, specialized transportation um, for non-ambulatory folks and up in our area everything everyone said is um the same it's similar um we've had uh our rural transit arrowhead transits picked up food delivery services the duluth transit authority was um ready to do that if um needed and it's the same and then every other conference i'm on that talks about it nationally we all probably Minnet has heard the same from, you know, just beyond our region to that we're all in the same boat. Um, 
we had particular problems with like the volunteer driver agencies because those um, driver volunteers tend to be in the higher risk category and a lot of them just shut down completely and are still struggling maybe in how to reopen safely. Um, I'm seeing more struggles on their end than from the public transit and some that might, the funding does have something to do with that. Well, thank you. I think oh, Jill, Jill, you were, um, well, Katie, do you have a follow-up? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add volunteer driving has been kind of a huge thing this year, big issue for us in the state of Minnesota because um, we're finding that volunteer drivers, not only are they, you know, in typically the higher risk categories, but also if um, their insurance company finds out that they're volunteer driving, they kind of charge them premiums, like they're driving for Uber or something, which they can't afford. A lot of them are retired. They're just trying to help out their community. So we've been trying to work with the legislator to come up with a new bill that we have that even just defines what a volunteer driver is just to get that out in the open. And that has been kind of put on hold a little bit given that COVID happened and all of a sudden we had to adapt to all these different obstacles. So we have been working on addressing that again. That's actually something we're going to be talking about at the conference coming up here. But yeah, that is all. I, I agree. That is a huge issue going on in Minnesota right now. Thank you. Jill, you were going to touch on um, what your agency is doing. Thanks, Dan. Um, hi, everyone. I'm in northern um, lower part of Michigan along the uh, Lake Michigan shoreline. Uh, our area is a rural area, um, very tourist um, heavy area, both in the winter and during the summer months. Um, we uh, like a lot of other agencies jumped on the bandwagon right away and started providing um, free rides uh to uh sorry i've got the radio on um we free rides uh for all all passengers uh we also um started delivery service right away so since about the third week of march we've been providing um, assistance to our local commission on aging uh, for delivery of uh, their hot meals uh, for a short period of time. And then they switched over to frozen meals, um, which they considered their disaster meals once our stay at home order um, was put in place. And uh, even though the stay at home order has been lifted, um, they are continuing to provide frozen meals for anybody who wishes to receive those because our congregate meal sites are not opened yet. So um, we've played a major role with the Commission on Aging uh, to get out uh, meals to the senior population uh, here in our county. Um, the deliveries weren't only for meals. We did food pantry boxes. Uh, we've been working for several years uh, with one of the local food pantries. And uh, so that um, partnership was even uh, strengthened more um, over the past six months uh, with COVID. Uh, we've been doing more and more for them. Um, and another food pantry in the county um, has contacted us and we've been doing deliveries uh, for the food pantry uh, for them versus having folks come um, to them. So uh, that those are a couple things that we really um, became an essential part of, of the community um, over the last six months were, were the deliveries. Um, we also did delivery of prescriptions and um, we service an island in Lake Michigan. And so uh, things are a little different out on the island and uh, we were picking up mail for folks and delivering their mail um, out on the island. Uh, we were for one gentleman, we were making arrangements for the driver to pick up his bridge card and drop it off to the grocery store um, on the island. There's one grocery on the island. This island has about 400 um, full-time year-round residents on the island. And uh, they would drop off the card one day because they had to have the card to be able to um, run his 
uh, grocery um, payment. And so he would send his list of food um, needs and the card, our driver would drop it off uh, for him. And then the next day she would pick up the, the items at the grocery store and then deliver uh, not only her, his senior meal to him, but also his groceries. Um, so that was a little unique with uh, having the bridge card um, involved. Uh, we are doing grocery deliveries for other folks um, who were able to use the uh, grocery store app and order online. But what we found was that there were a lot of folks that just didn't have the ability uh, to use that technology. And we saw that as a huge issue um, for, for our, basically our seniors uh, for the most part. Uh, was the, the grocery um, piece of that. So we've actually been working on a delivery program and um, in partnership with our Commission on Aging, where we will be able to uh, work with the Commission on Aging staff and our staff and the senior to get their grocery list that have um, whatever their needs are and put that uh, their shopping list into the technology for them and order the, uh, the groceries for them. And then um, through a mechanism that we already have in place, an online wallet per se customer account, they'll be able to pay us um, for their groceries and we will do the shopping or pick them up and then deliver them through them. And then um, we pay the bill once a month to, to the uh, grocery store. So um, it's a work in progress. We've got some kinks to, to work out on that yet, but uh, Commission on Aging and um, our boards are very interested in taking it one step further um, for, um, helping the folks that just were having a rough time with the grocery piece of it um, over the last six months. So we um, were looking for, for where the holes were at and trying to um, start developing plans and processes to uh, fill some of those holes. Should we see another stay at home order? Uh, come this fall or, or next winter, knock on wood, we won't, but um, uh, you never know what's going to happen. Um, uh, somebody, I think maybe it was Tom mentioned, uh, you know, stakeholders uh, going to them more so than us, them coming to us, and that's been the case here as well. Um, we've been the ones reaching out to um, the different organizations that we work with, um, just keeping them informed of what we're doing as far as cleaning and um, you know what uh, efforts that we've made to um, just be that extra piece of the puzzle for folks that um, maybe need some additional help and um, that's been real um, beneficial on our end uh, to help keep some of our uh, not only ridership but also the deliveries um, going uh, to and that helped keep um, you know some of our staff employed uh, we we uh, laid off about 80% of our staff um, at the height of uh, the COVID pandemic. So um, uh, we're slowly seeing a, a comeback, um, very, very slow. Uh, with the schools, um, I don't know about others here in Michigan, what your school districts are doing. Our school districts are not doing social distancing on their buses. Um, and we are not following suit with that. Um, our, our guidelines are that we will follow the social distancing, the six foot for as long as it's a recommended thing. So um, like Tom had mentioned, you know, a, a 24 passenger bus or a, a 22 passenger bus, we're down to six or eight um, people or seats. Um, our 16 passengers, we're actually gonna only transport with four seats in use. And the only time there'll be two people in a seat would be if they're in the same household. So, um, you know, we talk about 
having that extra money and, and such. And our, while our expenses are down, you know, the cost per passenger is, is going up because we're not putting as many passengers on those buses. So um, it's going to be an interesting start to the school year for sure. And, and hopefully we, um, we all make it through unscathed. So knock on wood up here, we've, you know, we've not had a whole lot of cases. Um, I think in June, I, I remember um, during the expo in June, I had mentioned on, on the one session, we had like 12 cases at all and, and folks weren't taking things very seriously up here. Um, and we're still finding that to be the case. Um, we're up to, I think, 54 cases right now, which isn't a lot compared to a lot of other areas. So um, we're being more diligent about our cleaning and our processes. Um, and we're making sure that folks understand that just because as people are becoming more complacent, we feel like we need to take those extra steps. Jill, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't you use a UV light on tripod? Yeah, L'Oreal, we did. Um, we bought three UV lights and we use those in the buses. Um, we set all three of them up down the aisle of the bus so that we can do one application, five minute application and we're done. Um, and then because those are on tripods versus hanging them um, in the bus, we can also move them into the um, facilities and use them in our offices as well. So we've got several layers of, of cleaning that we're doing. Not only are we using disinfectant wipes and sprays, um, we're using the UV lights every morning before the buses go out. And then we just purchased another product. Um, it's like a um, fogger uh, that we're gonna hold on to that and use that if there's ever an exposure um, on the bus, that'll just be another layer. Um, for us as a cleaning product to do. And we purchased a product that um, is sprayed into the vents of our air conditioning and, and heating system as uh, another layer of cleaning. Thank you. If anyone has any questions about safety in the time of COVID, I promise you Jill is the go-to contact. If you want some more details, if you go on our expo tab on our website and click on mini expo, the safety session is where Jill spoke and a few other colleagues spoke detailing everything that they were doing from fogging and UV to wheelchair securement and PPE. It is a great resource and I encourage you to check out the recorded session. Why don't we move on to question two? Thank you. So what keeps you up at night regarding your efforts to serve your community? Some of that may have been covered, but Anybody have specifics? Uh, my name is James McClary. I'm on the board of Bloomington Transit in Bloomington, Indiana. And um, we had cut our service back pretty dramatically, but we had the fear that um, something could happen and we would have to shut the whole system down. So what we did was uh, we reached out to Uber, which I know some people don't like, but uh, we have an agreement with Uber now that in the case of a complete system shutdown, we can use Uber on a contractual base to uh, fill the need of people who really need transportation. I, I have to say the board uh, voted three to, three to one to pass it because <laughs> uh, some people don't like Uber and some people felt that they were not doing social distancing. But, uh, but at least it, it gives us an out that uh, if we do have to shut the whole system down, we at least have an opportunity to provide some form of transportation. And by the way, we've had one driver test positive and we've had uh, two mechanics tested. One of them was negative, one of them was positive. The one driver who tested positive, it was a very mild, mild case. And um, we followed all the CDC guidelines and uh, he had not been in contact with a passenger for over 15 minutes, which is what, what the CDC says. So we were able to, uh, to avert that bullet. So, but the fear we had was that uh, it might be that the whole system would have to shut down. And we, and even, I mean, normally we are transporting 12,000 people a day and we're down to 2,000. Uh, you know, it's been inching back up, but those 2,000 absolutely positively have no other choice. So at least we have an option for them. Thank you. 
others feedback anything to add I'll jump back in, Dan. One of the things that I saw, um, like I mentioned, we'd laid off a good share of our staff. And um, even right now, um, we've brought back all of our full-time staff um, as far as our drivers, which is only seven of drivers. Um, the majority of our driving staff was part-time. Uh, we had four dispatchers. And at this point, um, we have not brought back one dispatcher we are filling that service or that, that portion of, of our service. Our, um, those tasks are being handled by the folks that would typically be our mobility management um, staff and our other operations staff, uh, the ones that are doing our verification and, and some of the other um, tasks at, at hand. So um, right now, we're just not seeing the numbers rebound enough um, to have a dispatcher come back. Um, on Friday last week, we, um, our, our staff's working four tents, and the one gal was on vacation, and uh, the other one had the Friday off, and I answered phones all day. And I think um, I input less than 50 same-day rides. Um, so that's concerning to me that our numbers aren't rebounding a little bit better. Um, after what we saw in June and July, I expected August to, to look better than what we're seeing. And our numbers so far for the month of August are actually sliding backwards a little bit. Um, so as a manager, my big concern right now, not only, you know, the safety of, of our staff and our passengers, but is, um, the livelihood of, of my staff and the fact that um, I've got so many people that are still laid off and um, with especially the full-time staff, you know, we've been covering their health care costs while they've been laid off. Um, but our county has, you know, said we're, you know, we can only do this for so long, which, you know, I, I agree. And, um, you know, we're coming to an end here pretty quick um, with being able to continue to pay benefits for, for staff that's not working. And so um, it's a little disheartening, you know, to, to know that we're going to have three or four people that are probably going to um, end up being permanently laid off um, unless our county can reassign them into other positions. Um, because we're just not seeing a rebound um, of rides like what we would have hoped. Um, you know, we, I think we all figured that this was going to be a slow rebound, um, and, and we were bracing for that, um, and we're still bracing for it to be a long haul, um, but just that weighs heavy every day, um, you know, knowing that, um, you know, we've got staff that's not going to be returning. Are there others who have uh, people that are laid off currently that um, you know have concerns about them, you know, coming back or or when the rides do rebound, have the you know, the staff to to cover that? Dan, this is Becky with um, in Indiana again. We're all back except for one route that um, we had to like eliminate for a while because the driver had to go ahead and retire because his wife had a liver transplant during all this. So he's not gonna be able to come back because of her immune, immune, whatever. I can't talk either. So um, my biggest problem is, you know, my, some of my folks were on furlough. Now everybody's back. And now I don't have enough personnel to keep up with what is going on here. Um, I'm having to dispatch all this week because I only have two dispatchers now. Um, one has been absorbed into a different part of the agency for case management for the COVID um, thing that we're doing with United Way. And then the other one is off on medical leave that's something totally unrelated to COVID. So one of my girls is on vacation, so I'm on the phones all week helping with dispatch and I've been on this call and I've only had three calls. So it's not too awful bad, but one person can't do it all day. They would go crazy. <laughs> and, and so that's my problem, having enough drivers. I finally got a new hire who's sitting next to me watching training videos. Um, but 
that's what my problem is. I'm worried I'm not going to be able to keep up with what we with the demand we have, which is not back to regular by any stretch of the imagination. We're maybe a quarter of the way there. Thank you. I saw Tom Wagner had his hand up in the little list here. I'm unsure if he still has a question or a comment to make. Sure, it wasn't related. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sure, it wasn't related to staffing. That's why I lowered my hand. But um, I just wanted to, um, you know, one of the concerns that we have here in Wisconsin. My name's Tom Wagner, by the way. I'm the um, chair of the uh, WIPTA here in Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Public uh, Transportation Association. So we have members that are uh, rural. Uh, uh, large urban, small urban, so wide variety that we represent. And uh, one of our concerns is that um, because the state is uh, struggling with revenues uh, for the 2021, the next biennium budget that we're going to have, and they see <clears throat> the uh, how the uh, federal government um, stepped up and provided trans transportation funds that there might be a concern that the state would say okay you guys are okay then because you got those federal funds um, and <clears throat> excuse me um, so I, I we're concerned that that would um, that there might be a movement here in Wisconsin to in uh, the next uh, budget cycle um, to reduce funding for transit systems, at least temporarily, but nobody, everybody knows that it's never a temporary uh, reduction if that were to happen. Um, I, I think it was at the last CTA legislative uh, meeting I attended, uh, there was talk about putting together a white paper regarding that issue. And I was just hoping that uh, something had been developed. I haven't received anything yet, but uh, that that's something that would be helpful, um, you know, to to use uh, with our legislators um, to make sure they're aware that no, the funding that we received is is not adequate to to allow the state to reduce its share of funding that we need to provide the services in our communities. Yeah, I remember um, us talking about that and we haven't yet, but we definitely will be working on that along with the toolkit in the fall because that is super important and we don't, I'm sure there are many, many states that would love to reduce the amount of funding that they'll give. So that's something that we're definitely watching too. Um, it's the same thing in Indiana. They uh, did cut some of our state dollars this year. Um, um, our agency is a loss of 100,000 of state dollars because they've already cut some. So, but yeah, interested about the white paper. Oh yes. Well, thanks. Minnesota. Well, let's move on. Let's move on to the last question so we can get some feedback on that. What can we as CTA be doing to support your efforts to serve your people in your community? What more would you like us to do for you? Well, it's Becky again. I just want to say thank you because when this first started, I was lost. And so the first people I reached out to was CTAA or the first people that even showed there was a, an issue to help or ready to help with CTAA. And so I really appreciated that. So thank you, ladies, and make sure Scott knows. <laughs> well, yeah. So I, I guess my question, and I don't know if the statistic is out there, but I don't know of any transit systems that's had to re cut their service back because of COVID. I know there's a fear of that, but I don't know of any systems, and maybe there are some out there, but that would be something that CTAA could do, would be a survey of members to find out if anybody's had to cut their service back as a result of the COVID. And uh, I know there's a fear there, but I don't believe that it's factual. So James, when you say cut service because of COVID, is it because a rider presumably got the disease on the bus and not necessarily because 
there's just not enough riders because enough things aren't open. No, I'm, I'm talking about somebody actually getting the, the driver, for instance, infecting other passengers or the passengers passing along to another passenger. Um, I, I know we're all suffering because of loss of riders, but I don't know of any that have actually contracted the disease on a, on a transit vehicle. There are probably some. I, I just don't know. But that would be something that CTAA could do, would be to do some kind of a survey to find out if that, in fact, has happened. Thank you. Hey, Dan, maybe you know. Um, didn't DDOT have, I know DDOT had at least one driver who was sick. Um, didn't they close service for a couple days? I, I know it wasn't for long, but didn't, or what, SMART, one of them, didn't they close service for a day or a few days um, back toward the beginning? I don't recall exactly, you know, who was impacted, but I do believe I heard something to that effect. I even think uh, Lansing um, slowed service for uh, a couple of days before they went, you know, back back online. Uh, but I'm I'm not aware of anybody. I do, I do know. I, I believe Detroit did lose a driver, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yes. to COVID, but whether or not they contracted that on the bus or not, I don't know that that was, was determined, but I'm not aware of any passenger stories that I've heard where, you know, individuals have, have contracted the illness. I think the other thing that, um, you know, I think about it, it's been a, a challenge for me, you know, I'm part of a uh, county government, and so our return to work plan you know, affects the whole, um, all county employees. And, and the questionnaire always refers to, have you ridden on mass transit? And I think uh, that's something that the message out there is often confused between, you know, flying on an airplane or getting on a subway is different than rural transportation. And so, you know, I often ask that question. So if a county employee rides, you know, public transit to work, do they have to quarantine for 14 days because they, they rode the bus? With all the precautions that we've put in place, I'm confident that our passengers, you know, have a safe environment to travel. And so that mass transit definition, uh, I guess, bothers me when, when that's used. So that, that's one of, the, one of the fears I have that uh, people may have a perception that's not reality. And I know when we've, I've been part of some discussions where that's been debated, uh, you know, I, I don't have the, the data to support this, but that, you know, air travel actually is, is among, you know, a safe way to travel as well. I think the jury is still out on what, uh, you know, a packed subway can, can do. But again, I, I, I think if you, from what I've heard, you know, even the travel on the subways have been light compared to, you know, normal activity. In the beginning, when we had layoffs, uh, we had two drivers that contracted COVID and uh, they both passed away. But that was during their layoff period and it didn't affect the transit or the riders at all. I'm sorry to hear that. Yes, it was a loss. As far as uh, what CTAA can do to help support us, um, I think you guys have really done a great job uh, throughout the whole pandemic. Um, you're the my go-to spot for information uh, right from the start, and I, you know you are really quick to start getting information out and into our hands, and that was really appreciated. Um, it, it helped us be able to to develop what we were going to do and how were we were going to respond in a very timely manner. Um, so I really appreciate everything that all of you have done um, down there. Um, as far as uh, the regional discussions that you're holding here today, um, I've long thought that that should be something that should be going on. Um, that, you know, we've got our, our people that are sitting on the boards and that are um, representing our areas, but it didn't seem like we were ever hearing um, from them with updates on what was going on from CTAA. You know, Scott's real good about sending out information, um, but regionally it didn't seem like we were getting a lot of information. So I, I thank you for, for this forum. Um, that, that's wonderful and I hope it will continue. And um, I look forward to uh, continuing to be a member and 
contributing where I can. And um, again, thank you for all that you've done for us. It's really been appreciated. Thank you. Well, we have about five minutes left. Does anybody have more that they'd like to share? This is off topic, but I want to know how long it took you to grow all that on your face, Dan. <laughs> I think I started in January and was going to was gonna <laughs> give it up after uh, the end of February. And since I've been working from home, I just let it go. Well, By the governor, way, great clips will not trim your beard now. When our governor shut off the barber shops, I had something going for about four weeks, but nothing like yours. <laughs> well, it, it's not going to last long. <laughs> Great. All right, Taylor. Let's hit that last. All right. And and thank you very much. We recorded this. We will make sure that this gets to everyone who needs to see it, including yourself. So we will get that back out to you in case there's any nuggets that you wanted to refer back to as you go through this crisis and hopefully what will be the return of transit. Again, if you have any questions, my name is L'Oreal Lance, your membership and business development director, and I can be reached at Lance, L-A-N-C-E, at ctaa.org, and I'm always eager to hear directly from our members. And thank you again. All right.